Welcome to all those watching the latest in this series of Health Tech World Roundtables. And today we're focusing on revolutionizing cancer research and cancer care. We've got a fabulous group of panelists with us who bring with them a wealth of experience and knowledge and understanding of the subject. Uh, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to start our discussion today by introducing themselves and saying a little bit about who they are their organizations and what their particular areas of focus are. Uh, and then we'll move on to cover a number of areas uh, across that spectrum of how we revolutionize cancer care and research. So if I could start off with uh, with Alex. Hi, and uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Alex Evis. Um, I put Alexandra in the chat, so um, you know I'm a woman, but maybe that was obvious. Um, by email, it isn't necessarily obvious. So uh, EMIS Group is an electronic health record provider in the UK. So we provide point of care systems to primary care, community pharmacy, community and mental health services and A&E departments. Um, we also have a number of kind of patient facing services. So we have a, the patient access app, which has 16 million registered users and about 2 million people using it every month and a patient information website called Patient Info that's kind of authored and peer reviewed by clinicians. We're best known, I think, for primary care. So we have about 60% market share. We serve about over 4,000 uh, GPs. And, and that also makes us the data custodian for probably about 36 million patient records uh, in England and, and many millions more across the, the home nations. Um, uh, so primary care generally in terms of sort of cancer, obviously cancer is usually sort of treated and, and, and detected in secondary care in hospitals. Um, but increasingly, and what I think is really interesting, uh, where we have the, the GP record in the UK now being the master record and all the um, information from other clinical system flows into that GP records, we're able to kind of look at the data in the GP record um, and start to, to uh, find patients very early, diagnose patients early, or find patients that might be at risk, um, or you know, even more excitingly, uh, give patients treatments and vaccines that might prevent cancer in the first place. So that's my interest and in why I'm here. Thanks very much, Alex, and I'm sure we'll return to some of those themes as the discussion unfolds. Uh, Chaim, could I ask you to introduce yeah. yourself, please? Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Chaim uh, Linhart from uh, IBEX. Uh, my background is in computer science, um, and I am a co-founder and CTO at IBEX Medical Analytics. And we, we developed a platform uh, that uses uh, artificial intelligence to help uh, diagnose cancer. And I'll explain how it works. So when there's a suspicion of cancer, uh, typically, uh, the patient would undergo a biopsy, so they would take out a piece of tissue and send it to the, to the pathology lab, where that tissue is uh, fixated, sliced, stained, and placed on a glass slide. And then uh, a clinician, a pathologist, uh, reviews that, uh, that slide, either under a microscope or after it is digitized uh, on a computer screen. Uh, and come up with a, a diagnosis. Is there cancer and, and so on? Um, our platform analyzes these digitized uh, slides and basically helps the pathologist uh, find a uh, tumor in those slides, uh, the type of cancer, its grade, its size, and many other clinical features. Uh, and this way we ensure higher accuracy of diagnosis more complete and objective uh, pathology reports, and also faster turnaround times. Um, the platform is, is uh, deployed around the world, and, and this is something we're very proud of. So there are uh, labs uh, in the UK, in Europe, in the US, and, and elsewhere that basically changed, uh, totally changed the way uh, they uh, practice pathology. And instead of just looking at, at images, uh, uh, manually and and com and, and uh, completing the pathology report, they uh, use AI throughout this process, um, and uh, yeah, uh, helping them uh, especially on the accuracy part and efficiency. Thanks very much, Chaim. 
Uh, Irad. Yeah, sure. So, uh, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, having me. So I'm Irad, I'm the CTO of Belong.life. And uh, what Belong.life is, is the patient engagement platform. Uh, when we started seven years ago, we started with cancer. That was our uh, main focus at, at, that, at that time. Um, my profession specifically is, is in the big data and analytics field, later on ML and AI. I've been doing this for 25 years. And my last uh, few companies were in that space, but seven years ago, when I lost my mother to cancer, I understand that uh, as a big data guy, I was missing a lot of data that could help her in her journey. And that's why we and my colleagues established Belong. Uh, so fast forward to today, uh, Belong is the world's largest social network for cancer patients and caregiver. But we didn't stop at cancer. We evolved into other uh, chronic slash acute illnesses such as multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, Crohn, colitis, obesity, etc. But our uh, main focus uh, still in, um, is in cancer, where we serve millions of patients around the globe. The majority are in the United States, but we are in over 100 countries. And the Belong platform actually provides them with a one-stop shop for everything they need in their journey. Uh, when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer support, so we have a lot of uh, smart connectivity of patients with, that meets other patients with similar journeys, not just similar diagnosis. Then we have uh, experts that answer every question in their journey, anything from you know, clinical to emotional to behavioral kind of questions. Then we have management tools, Alaris management tools that allows them to organize their documents smartly, share it securely, organize their treatment tasks, see what other people has done that it has similar journeys to them, and also clinical trial matching. So this is what we do uh, for patients. Mm -hmm. And um, we also provide uh, with the healthcare organization to use our platform as a SaaS model, like a white label solution, so they can use the stack that we have and provide service to their cl clients. So we have patient support programs that, is, um, that pharma is using to serve their patients. Providers use our platform to serve their patients inside and outside of their clinics. And very recently, we took all this data and trained uh, a model. And we launched Dave and Tara, which are AI uh, mentors that helps patients in their journey. Dave is more in the oncology part of the journey. Tara is in the clinical trial matching uh, part of the journey. And it is already used by millions and uh, you know, provide the great uh, care, empathetic accuracy. Uh, both on our platform and to our clients. Great, thanks very much for that, Irad. I'm glad you explained who Dave and Tara were behind you there on the screen. Uh, they are they we... are my co-workers. <laughs> uh, you, could, we... you, could, you could also hear, so apologies, you could hear in the background another Dave, which is my dog, so uh, apologies <laughs> for that. I'm sure it's taken years of training, Alex. Uh, can I come to you firstly, Alex? I'd like to dive into uh, the big issues relating to how we do revolutionize and increase the pace of research and care with reference to cancer particularly. Uh, could you say something about what you regard as the big issues or opportunities uh, with reference to that process of revolutionizing care and research? Yeah, I mean... I mean, I think the, the the big opportunities is 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 bringing forward diagnoses, is early diagnosis. You know, at the moment, almost half of cancer cases um, are, are not diagnosed until they're stage three and four. Um, so, stage three means it's already spread to surrounding tissues um, and or the lymph nodes. Stage four means it's spread to at least one other organ, and you know. Uh, Pretty obviously, I suppose the outcomes and survival rates at stage three and four are, are, are much worse um, than outcomes at stage one and two. So I think that's the the kind of the big opportunity. Um, in the UK, we've been collecting data in, in digital form since the 1980s, um, and all the data from different healthcare settings flows back into the GP record. So as you can imagine, there's kind of a wealth of information in that record um, about the patient um, and potentially risk factors that um, that can create risk scores um, for, for different cancers. One of the big challenges um, that we have um, in the UK certainly is, um, is the ability, 
sort of wrapped up in information governance is the ability to, to process that data at sort of the scale required to, to, to find people, um, whether that's individuals or sort of groups of patients. Um, so because we process the data at source and we, we're custodians of that data anyway, um, what we do is act on behalf of the, the GPs or the, the clin clinicians themselves uh, and enable us to sort of process the data for them and then surface um, the lists of patients to that clinician uh, so they can take some action and then design a kind of care pathway that's suitable around that. So that might be uh, inviting, automatically inviting a patient in uh, for an appointment at the GP, but it might also be signposting or referring them to a, a community diagnostic centre. Um, so there's some sort of there's some pros and there's some pros and cons in the UK, um, but there's a there's certainly a massive opportunity to to benefit patients. Chaim, uh, would you go along with that, or are there supplementary areas you would highlight? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so I agree uh, with uh, Alex. Uh, I'd like to also add. So so working you know with with pathologists and oncologists, uh, we learned that. Uh, there's a lot of information and in the data that we already collect uh, for each patient and that we don't necessarily fully utilize that data. And there are several reasons. So first of all, there are multiple modalities. There's pathology, there's imaging, there's genetic, clinical. And, and for human beings, it's, uh, we're pretty good at combining information, but we don't necessarily do it very accurately and we don't do it based on huge data sets. It's more kind of personal experience uh, and, and there is a, a room for um, machine learning methods that are based and trained on huge data sets with multiple sources of data to come up with more accurate results. So that's one part. The other part is that it, along this process, and, and I, I know mostly about the pathology, so I can relate to that, there are points that are very subjective uh, by nature. So if you talk about, for example, grading uh, of many cancer types or scoring various types of biomarkers, they are very subjective and sometimes sometimes also quantitative, which is difficult for, for, uh, for human beings. And there, I think, um, computational methods can really contribute to making that more accurate, more producible, uh, more consistent once once we have more accurate, quantitative, consistent results, we can then take it to the next level and see, you know, how do we match the right treatment uh, to each and every patient? And, and this, I think, will result in more personalized uh, healthcare. Thanks, Chaim. Uh, Irad, uh, big areas in terms of breakthrough or, or areas where there is some resistance to the things that will revolutionize care? Well, uh, there are quite a few, you know, uh, healthcare uh, has been like for many years, a dinosaur in the, in the health tech <laughs> uh, industry, where it takes a lot of time to embrace new technologies. And it's not only because of uh, you know, wheel or time, but it's also because of regulation. It's a highly regulated space. And when you want to plug in a new solution, it's kind of hard to be early adopters in, in healthcare. And this is why it usually technologies find their way towards the end, also to healthcare and not in the beginning. So, but we are here, like uh, myself and and I guess Alexander and Heim are here to to break that, that, that resistance cycle. Because uh, we believe there is uh, huge opportunities for technologies like AI, for instance, like ML, to accelerate things and to cope with scale. One of the biggest problems with healthcare is scale. Uh, like with high, there are more biopsies generated every day. Uh, on, on my end, there are more patients um, diagnosed with cancer every day. And the, the, uh, the team or the, the, the amount of uh, clinicians and experts are limited. So you need to use technology to bridge that, that gap somehow. And this is where we find those organizations more receptive to, uh, to embrace new technologies. Like for example, in, in our case, one of our solutions, it's patient support program. And the, um, the old way of patient support program is having a nurse calling a patient on a daily basis to check, check on how they're doing and if they're taking their drugs, okay. 
And you can automate a lot of these things with, with great applications and nowadays with generative AI. So these are, these, these are the things that we, for example, do. We are uh, allowing to scale so the doctors can focus on the complex things while the simple things like bureaucracy, simple questions, educational questions, those kind of things that uh, patients are putting a lot of burden on the healthcare system can be and are already solved and addressed with AI when it is well trained to do so. One of the biggest challenges was to have, for example, with Dave and Tara, to have a, an, an accurate model that can go through the boundaries of legal that will be responsible. Because in healthcare, you have to not only to comply with pharmacovigilance or all those things, you have to be responsible. There are things you cannot say to patients. There are things you need to report to a higher degree. It's important to for AI, for example, to say, I'm not dealing with this. I'm escalating this to a real human. So this is where the challenge relies. And when we developed what we do, we addressed everything to go and comply and play with the regulations of that space so it will allow them to adopt the technology faster. I think that's a that's a really good point there, Ad, is that we often don't consider the the kind of demand supply, you know, that actually the delivery sh chassis for the UK or for the health system hasn't changed very much in a number of years. So we may find lots more people, but is there the capacity for those people to be screened? Are there enough clinicians to see them? But without the changing the workflow and automating the workflow as well, you know, you're not necessarily going to get the, the results. Is there, does some of that technology you've referred to there, Alex, and that you talked about, Irad, play into this idea of individuals taking more responsibility for their own health care, this self-care concept enabled by data and technology to take some of that weight off those lighter areas? Alexander, you want to go first? Um, I mean, definitely change. I mean, behavior change is always uh, uh, incredibly difficult. Um, but I think, you know, we have very much in the UK traditionally had um, with the NHS a sickness service um, rather than a healthcare service. And the amount of funding that goes into prevention and uh, and public health is is generally much smaller than than you know, the bulk of the spend is still in hospitals. So I think we are seeing a, a sort of a shift to a more kind of consumer and um, uh, a consumer healthcare kind of approach where we're you know we're adopting wellness met methods. But a lot of that is around information and getting people information in a digestible format. Um, as early as possible. So, uh, and I think some of this data stuff has a, has a, has a role to play there. Um, what is more complicated is the business model of it because actually people are well, certainly in the UK not used to paying <laughs> for, 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 for that. So, um, and the NHS maybe also isn't used to paying for that. So how do you, you know, it, it would be great if you could know your risk score um, for uh, for cancer or for cardiovascular disease and um, and say, well, actually, your risk score is high because you smoke or you drink too much or you're not active enough. And, you know, why don't you change your why don't you try changing your behaviors in these ways and then have that constant feedback loop? So you're then seeing, you know, your risk score coming down in real time. Is that the sort of, you know, can you gamify health in that sort of way? Um, I think there are, you know, we're seeing more and more companies kind of emerging in that space. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a way to go. Um, it's difficult from a startup perspective, I think, to kind of to uh, break through. I don't know, Irad and Chaim, whether you agree from that perspective. Yeah. Can I say a few good words on the NHS? Uh, oh, so um, I, I love the NHS. Yeah, yeah no. Amazing people delivering amazing care, and I really hope I don't come across as negative. <laughs> um, I'm joking, I'm joking. I, I, yeah, I, I just want to highlight. Um, yeah, so so uh, something that we we see uh, in in many uh, geographies. So there isn't always a, a clear, direct commercial, let's say, uh, 
uh, economic incentive for, for pathology labs specifically, and this could be also in, in other uh, medical fields, to, for example, improve accuracy. Uh, they want they want to be accurate, of course. The physicians very much uh, want to be accurate, and the the labs want to be accurate. But um, adopting new technology like AI in order to uh, improve by uh, you know decrease your error rate from say one percent to zero point one percent, they don't really have a, a way to pay for it until there is formal uh, reimbursement by the healthcare system. Uh, however in places like the UK where you have the NHS and you have and, and the same organization provides the, the healthcare and is the basically the insurer and uh, bears the costs of, of, of uh, healthcare. Uh, in those places, it is easier to make the case for improving accuracy. Uh, for example, um, the same organization pays for the, the for its own mistakes. So I think in that respect, this is something that uh, works well in certain geographies like the UK, like Israel, uh, and it's more of a challenge in other places, uh, which also basically um, pushes back on, on the rate of adoption of uh, new technology. Yeah, I want also to uh, to, sorry, to yeah. add a few things uh, to what um, Alex said. Um, so, yes, we do see that in the past 10 years, uh, there is a shift in patient behavior uh, to be more like consumer-like um, actors in this healthcare uh, play. And it, it, it radiates in, in, in many ways. There are the good sides of, of the equation where patients are investing more time in educating themselves and being involved in the journey up to uh, you know, places where they are highly involved in the decision-making process. And in some circumstances, it's even, you know, put a lot of burden on the doctors who needs to explain to them why that thing they read on Google is not related to their actual diagnosis. Um, and so there's a fine line that goes, you know, between uh, those things. And what, what we found out is that in order to make patients, you know, educated, you need to bring them into a trusted environment with trusted data. And this is one of the reasons we created Belong. So we want to educate patients. The real name of Belong, the, the Belong uh, company, is Belong Tail. And the Belong Tail, uh, the long tail in the pro prognosis is where the outliers are, are, those who kind of beat the statistics. And we want to make people beat the statistics, not by only uh, understanding the data behind patient journeys and help science to do that, what, which, we'll, which we do, but also to make patients more involved in the process so they can make educated decisions. For example, ask for the right genomic testing that is more relevant for them. Um, uh, spend less time in the doctor visit on explaining what the tumor is and more about what treatment we should be doing. So those kind of things uh, makes them uh, highly educated and also maybe a little bit of consumers so they know what they should ask or focus on in their journey. And uh, it also addresses other things beyond the clinical part of the journey, because the, there's many other challenges. Uh, within the doctor office, you only treat the tumor and the symptoms, but outside you have many more challenges. So, so yeah, the, uh, the, the, um, the atmosphere is changing towards more a consumer-like uh, industry and everybody knows that, and they're and they're trying to improve the quality of uh, service to patients to allow them to to be that way. Uh, Iran, yeah, I really like your, the point you made. I think it's very important, um, and, and I want to give an example. So I guess some of uh, some of you and some of us uh, had uh, some kind of imaging test uh, in our life, X-ray or, or something else. And uh, I imagine that you, you wanted to look, to take a look at it, right? To see what, what did they find? Um, even if you don't really understand it, you're not going to do the, you know, the, the diagnosis by your own, but, but you wanted to look at it. And then that drove more involvement, as Irad explained very nicely, more involvement and, and you want to go get more information and maybe you ask the right questions. How many of you, well, may, maybe you didn't undergo a biopsy, but if you did have a biopsy, how many of you would have looked at their own tissue that was extracted from your body with you know, the diagnosis, hopefully not cancer, but some kind of diagnosis? The answer is probably zero. So very few people look at their own tissue. 
The reason is that until, let's say, a decade ago, pathology was not digitized, so you had to go and take the glass slide and get a microscope. But now that it, pathology is being digitized and dig digitization is, is being adopted in many, many uh, labs, uh, you'll get not just the pathology report saying you have diagnosis X uh, and, and so on, you'll get the slides, you can view the slides. And of course, we won't become expert pathologists, but we'll take a look and we'll ask the questions and we can consult more easily. And just being involved will, I think, as Irad explained, will push uh, not just our own uh, healthcare, but it'll push for more technology uh, to, to be uh, adopted in the field. Are there some issues around trust with reference to data? I mean, it seems to me that data and how we use it has enormous capacity to revolutionize some of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, are there issues about trust in terms of the provision of data and how it's used that need to be overcome? I mean, there certainly are in the UK. Um, so, and a lot of it is around how we communicate, I think. I think so. Um, we've had a few failed attempts at sort of um, centralizing patient data for planning and, and research in the UK. Um, and um, a, a lot, I'm not sure the media has been entirely helpful, um, but there has been, you know, sort of scares that your data is being sold or commercialized. Um, uh, and used for things that 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 you wouldn't want it to be used for. Actually, you know, when you do um, engage with the public in uh, in a more detailed way, you know, generally the public are uh, like you know, a, a, a sort of more than ninety percent positive about the use of data um, when it's for research. You know, you ask somebody if they're worried about using it about you know their their health data being shared, they'll all put their hand up. If you say, "Are you happy for it to be shared?" Um, to help a family member uh, to find a cure for for um, for cancer for a family member, it, you know everybody's like absolutely hundred percent. People want to share their data, and it's I think it's setting that those use cases and providing that reassurance um, and patients under being very very transparent in how it is used, and patients are then overwhelmingly positive. Unfortunately, you know maybe that that hasn't been done in the UK and we did have large numbers of people sort of opting out of their data being shared which actually potentially would you know will have a negative impact on their long-term health and, and and access to care so um yeah there's definitely still trust issues I think they can be overcome with the right engagement um uh, the right engagement and the right messaging and it's probably the most important sort of public health messaging in my view that we can that, that we can be doing in, in the near term. I think another aspect maybe of data and, and, and trust is uh, regarding how AI is trained. Uh, so not the, the raw data itself, but what data do we use to train AI and can we then trust the AI that was trained that way? So, and, and this has, uh, there are several questions that, that people uh, sometimes ask. So for example, uh, is the data, are the data biased? Um, for example, most of the, the, the research and also commercial companies, they use data from uh, European population, American population. So you don't have a lot of AI being trained uh, on, on you know, African uh, or, or other, you know, uh, other types of populations. And, and that, of course, might create a bias in the AI itself. Uh, and another question is, um, where do the labels or, or the annotations, uh, the ground truth for, the, for training the AI, where does it come from? Uh, who are the clinicians who set that, uh, those labels? Uh, does the AI learn from you know, a specific group of, of physicians and maybe they are biased towards certain guidelines and not others and so on? So I think there are multiple questions here. I think there are good answers, but I'm just raising the questions, which are uh, fair questions. Yeah, um, combating um, accuracy issues is one of the challenges, the biggest challenges ever, 
all of us um, uh, have been investing, I guess, a lot of time and effort and technology into. And, you know, as I'm 25 years in the business of data, I've seen all data. I've seen good data. I've seen bad data. Uh, and AI specifically is a game of data. You can create a new model. You can use a model of the, off the shelf. You can take the best model out there. If you plug in it with garbage data, you'll get garbage in, gar garbage out. Um, so it's, it's, it's in essence, it's a game of data. Those who uh, acquire the best data in a specific domain can create the best solution. And big data is, as, uh, or good data, as Chaim mentioned, is, is, uh, can include many elements that can make it a bad data, like bi biases, which uh, Chaim very articulated very well. Uh, there are many other things that can take data and make it and make a model less accurate and then create a trust issue. For example, if it's not domain specific, like if you train it on the internet or not on a domain specific, like, you know, chat GPT, then it will be very generic. It will not be highly focused. And, you know, those kind of engines will always provide you with an answer. They will never say, I don't know the answer. Even if they don't have the facts, they will sometimes invent facts. That's what we, it's called in the LLM uh, word, it's called hallucination. This is where chat GPT invent books that were never written, uh, places that were never created. And you cannot afford this, those kind of things in healthcare. This is one of the biggest challenge I had to face with my team to create Dave and Tara to combat hallucinations. Uh, so hallucination dr is driven from bad data and uh, not domain specific, uh, from diversity. Diversity, if you only take EMR data, you'll see maybe third of the picture. But if you train it on doctor to physicians communications, like, like we do on our platform, then you will allow uh, something like Dave to act as an oncologist while in a, actually in a virtual room talking to a patient and not just based on EMR data that is have snapshots of the journey. And longitudinal data is very important. Look at a long chain of events, not specific snapshots. So then you can understand a complete patient journeys and can address specific questions in every step of the way. And so those kind of things help you. Uh, and in the end, you also have to clean it up. You cannot take data and plug it in. You'll have to well label it. You have to run it through manual process of, of, of uh, clinic cleansing. And only then you can create something that is trusted um, and uh, I, I, ju I just want to share something uh, very um, important. I think it, uh, it will highlight the problem. There was a very big uh, article published on JAMA Oncology, a well-respectable uh, uh, place of publications. And they analyzed LLM models, and they found out that in 23% of the cases where they asked the question about the treatment, it provided a viable treatment, but not the right diagnosis or indication. So it, combined, it took a, a, a treatment of lung cancer and applied it to breast cancer, for instance. And in 13 of the cases, it hallucinated. It invented protocols that are not existed. Uh, so, for example, when we did what we do, we have to validate that we are following guidelines. So in healthcare, you have guidelines like the NCCN guidelines. So if you take a model and tell it or train it with guidelines data, then you'll get accuracy that is a must in the healthcare industry. That's really interesting, Irad. Uh, and, you know, I think it highlights how important it is that, uh, that data is communicated effectively and people understand what the benefits are uh, of data when it's used effectively and properly and, uh, and in the right way. Can I, can I ask if uh, the clinical establishment and clinicians generally are good at embracing change and some of these new technologies that promise substantial breakthroughs? Um, shall I go first? <laughs> so um, change management is hard and I think has to be thought, thought about in uh, for like early on. So um, uh, involving clinicians from and thinking about the implementation in the healthcare system is really, really important um, to do early. Um, I mean, we certainly experience as kind of, I would say, you know, we don't have a load of data scientists. We don't have, uh, we don't have people creating algorithms and risk predictions in house. We always work to implement them in the clinical system. And, and too often the kind of the, it, it comes quite late in the day that people, think about 
think about the implementation too like how will this actually work in clinical practice you know I you can't say oh here's a list of a thousand people to a GP and say you know they they're at higher risk of this you know they just don't wouldn't have the time to to to, to screen a thousand people so how would that work in practice do you need to spin up a a separate screening center do you need to you know change the the healthcare provision in some way um actually once when you think about that and you co-create stuff with clinicians and uh and work out you know how to deliver it effectively within clinical workflow from day one i think clinicians in, in embrace anything that can uh that can improve patient care um but we've just always got to be mindful of the kind of the, the time pressures and the burden when we've had, you know, I think it is a global challenge that the number of clinicians, uh, you know, is uh, is is unable to to meet the the demand of a sort of aging population and and growing healthcare needs. Um, but that's kind of why I think prevention is another thing that we haven't really talked about. But actually, you know, there's some really exciting sort of cancer vaccines and and things that are that are coming to market that you know, can can potentially stop um, stop the demand growing. Um, there's the HPV vaccination for, for cervical cancer. So one in 142 women in the UK get diagnosed every year with cervical cancer. There's 850 deaths each year linked to, in the UK linked to cervical cancer. And that's actually most common in, in women from deprived areas as well. Um, a few years ago, we worked out there was a, a sort of a landmark study that found that if you give an HPV vaccination to 12 to 13 year old girls, it reduces the risk of them getting cervical cancer by 87 percent, which is massive. So, you know, we started a, a huge vaccination program in the UK in, in, in schools. Um, but, you know, people fall through the gaps. Um, so we've been working at how you can use how you can use data to detect um, to detect some of the people that didn't ha have their vaccinations at school, and then use um, use GP practices or community pharmacies or sort of uh, or, or vaccination teams in different care settings to to mop up those um, those those people. So you can see that sort of work is going to you know it's just going to massively change. Um, uh, you know, hopefully the occurrence of cervical cancer um, and, and therefore kind of, you know, the clinical burden and obviously the, the, the patient burden of cervical cancer in the UK. Uh, I can share some of our uh, experience. Uh, so, 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 for example, and changes, by the way, changes always uh, could be difficult for all of us in every aspect of life. Uh, and certainly when, when it comes to diagnosing cancer. Uh, so when you ask a pathologist to move, for example, from uh, using the, the microscope to reviewing slides digitally, uh, some like it, some don't. They, they, they're used to their microscopes. What, why change anything? However, when you uh, provide them with really important uh, added value, then change becomes more uh, much more easy. And, and I can give an example. So. Um, in the first several years, most of our deployments of the AI were in uh, the context of a, a, a second read or a quality control tool. So the pathologist would keep diagnosing the, the, the slides the same way that they always did. Uh, we didn't change anything, but then the slides would be um, analyzed by our AI and we compared the AI findings to the pathology report and we would raise a flag if there was a potential discrepancy. Uh, pathologists working in labs around the world with this system uh, for prostate cancer specifically, they found, we find in every lab we worked with between two to 5% major mistakes. By major mistake, I mean uh, a prostate cancer that was entirely missed, so that the case was reported as benign, or a case reported with a low uh, grade, which was actually high grade. High grade in prostate typically means prostatectomy, an excision. So once a pathologist uh, sees this, uh, you can imagine their reaction. You can imagine how important it is for them to say, well, I want this. I, we need it. 
uh, and I need to change, we need to, to change something. So, and then moving from, from like a quality control workflow to primary diagnosis assisted by AI, that's the easy part. And, and I think in many ways it's like, you know, using, uh, let's say, notepad on your computer to, to write a document, and then someone comes with, with a, a word editor, like, like Microsoft Word or something similar, and suddenly you get a spell checker, and you get uh, fonts, and you get uh, grammar uh, checks, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you would embrace change very quickly. So, in fact, in some of our labs, for example, we had this very uh, interesting uh, case where the, the scanner, that, that scans these glass slides into um, uh, into files, uh, the scanner uh, didn't work for a few days, and the pathologist simply didn't report any prostate case in the lab. They they waited until the, the, the scanner would be fixed because they didn't want to go back to reporting without this extra help of AI. So I think change is, it's not easy, but if you if you show the, the, the benefits uh, then it, it, it can uh, you can promote it. And I think the harder part is not to convince the physicians that there is a lot of value in these new technologies, but I think the, 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 the challenge is uh, around the workflows, the integration with the various systems, how do we change everything around the basic technology, um, in addition to what Irad uh, said earlier, the, the regulatory part. Yes, I, I totally agree. It was well articulated by both Alex and, and Chaim. Um, to make an, an impact or a change in, in healthcare, it requires quite a few things. Um, you know, the one, the number one mistake that every new startup in the healthcare industry is doing is trying to add another screen or a widget on the doctor's screen. They already have plenty of applications in the system. They have to log everything they do. They don't need another screen to type in data to get value because they're already typing the, the patient data in so many places. <clears throat> so trying to add a new component into the system sometimes is hard because <clears throat> doctors don't want to work extra. They want to work less. They want to serve more patients in a given hour. And so the way to do it is to show them with a real value that can accelerate things for them. And <clears throat> like in, in, the, in our industry, for example, with patient support program, you have a nurse who needs to take care of a thousand patients on a drug. She can call them every day, she can text them, but if the machine is doing, like shooting out a questionnaire, data is coming in, AI is analyzing it, then she gets, who are the top, 20 people I need to contact immediately because we seem to have an adherence issues or safety issues. So I will start there and, and I will follow up with the other later on. This is one example. Like with clinical trial matching, you know, doctors are required to find patients and bring them into clinical trials in their site. And to make this conversation is sometimes take a lot of time and explain to them what is clinical trial or why is it still safe for them? What are the advantages for them in clinical trials? So if you automate this, like Tara, for example, that, that, that's what, what she does. She, she first educates and then she collects data and find out if the patient is eligible for a clinical trial. And then the doctor will only get a notice on their, on their desktop that says, um, that uh, Jimmy, who just walked into the office, is eligible for a trial. For that particular trial, let's have a discussion on that thing specifically. So if you save them time, then you will find them listening. The other thing that drives their decision-making is facts. Doctors, physician, healthcare is fact-based. You know, all those publications and everything is all fact-based. If it's, it doesn't have a number that proves something, they will not listen. So you need to research your own solution and find out the key values in terms of numbers that you can then show uh, your audience. For example, we save ER admissions in 15%. We save doctor visit time in 30%. If you state those numbers, like I guess with Heim, they accelerate uh, the tissue uh, sampling or examinations in whatever. So if you... If you test it out, if you do research, if you even do a peer review research, like we did with an oncology, with a, a hospital in Canada that showcased the value for patients and for the system, then the others will listen. 
So you need to bring in facts into the equation as well. And otherwise, they will see it as a nice to have thing. So as, as the environment, it's about demonstrating the value. Sorry, Chaim, you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, it's very important, of course, to, to generate evidence of the right studies and so on and, and uh, provide the numbers, as, as Irad said. Uh, I think, in addition, there's also, in, at least in some domains, uh, there is also the question of explainability. Uh, AI is a black box, and if the AI says, I think uh, you have cancer, or I think this is uh, X, if the clinician, you know, can't verify, can't confirm, can't check it, it's uh it, it's it's harder for them to use the ai um and, and so i think explainability or working with the physician not just instructing them this is what the ai decided i think that's also an important uh, uh thing to remember thanks Harim. uh alex mentioned prevention uh, and clearly that sits at the heart of quite a lot of the work that we've sort of skirted around today. Would anybody like to just expand on areas of development with reference to prevention and what a big part that's playing in some of the technological developments that are currently going on? I don't know if it's really exactly prevention, but I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, early detection, uh, in our case, mainly cancer, but uh, overall early detection is something uh, very important. And, and I think uh, AI or technology can really help there. Uh, sometimes there are you know very small tumors or borderline tumors and so on, or sometimes you can only reach the, the right conclusion if you combine uh, multiple data sources. And this is, again, something that I think uh, that is going to accelerate and improve uh, over time. And I think something that is perhaps, again, it's not doesn't fall under prevention, but is somehow related, is equality of, of healthcare. Um, so now if, if you have access to um, expert clinicians, whether it's pathologists, oncologists, or anyone else, uh, you're in a better position than someone uh, in a different uh, economical or, or a different geo than the new that who do not have such access. And I think technology and, and AI can, uh, you know, really bring uh, less expert physician clinicians to a more similar level to that of experts. The AI was trained by experts. The AI helps everyone equally. So I think that will also serve as a equalizer and uh, basically help uh, prevent or at least treat uh, disease in, in for, for many populations. Well, I mean, I've got another example of, of sort of prevention that, that, that we work on. So we've got a, um, a, <clears throat> a partnership with NHS England um, and MSD, which is a, a, a life science company, um, and working on the, the projects to, to helping to eliminate hep C. So hep C is a virus that's now entirely treatable if you catch it early, um, but it can be like asymptomatic for decades. So people can be living for, for a long time without knowing they have it. Um, and if you don't treat it, it then progresses into, uh, into sort of far more serious conditions that are difficult to treat. So I think it's 10 to 40% of people who have untreated hep C go on to have cirrhosis and one in five people with cirrhosis develop liver failure and one in 20 people who have cirrhosis go on um, to develop liver cancer. Uh, and I think there's about the, the, the estimate in the UK is um, there's around sort of 100,000 people um, that are living in England with hep C um, and they've uh, uh, either never been diagnosed or they've been diagnosed and, and not treated. So the, the project that we're working on is, is looking through uh, historical patient records um, on behalf of, of our um, clinicians, um, finding where hep C was either uh, coded um, as, as positive, but there was no record of treatment, or looking for sort of risk factors. So intravenous drug use, whether they had a blood transfusion or an, an, an organ um, transplantation, I think um, before 19... Is it 1982 or 1992? Anyway, I'm not sure. Um, and then once you've, you've found that that 
that at-risk at patient, we rather than surfacing that to a GP because it, they're not that well placed and they're, they're too busy to do something, that's that list of patients is surfaced to a specialist service called an operational delivery network, and they have people there that are really, really, uh, you know, highly trained in in contacting and reaching out to um, to groups of people, and then they can invite them in for for screening um, for. Uh, testing, screening, and, and if appropriate treatment. And that's kind of that beautiful win-win, right? So, uh, you know, it's great for, for patients, obviously, it, it increases, you know, system efficiencies. The World Health Organization has a goal to eliminate hep C by 2030. Um, but it's also, you know, it's for the manufacturer of the medication to treat it, it's obviously, you know, beneficial as well to find the patients and, and treat them as well. So that's kind of that win-win-win. That yeah, I also want to add to, to the prevention, uh, the prevention aspect. Um, there are two populations, as, as I see it, uh, that are dealing with prevention. One with a, some incentive and one with a lot of incentive. For example, I'll take myself. My dad was diagnosed or my mom uh, was diagnosed with lung cancer. My dad was diagnosed with pancreas cancer. So I'm into prevention in some sort right? Why? What can I do? Is it genetic? And if, if so, what can I do now to avoid it? Do I need to make, to do extra tests along my life? Do I need to make some more precaution about where, what I drink, what, what I eat? So I have this kind. This kind of incentive is still low. The population is still not fully incentivized to take care of that, even if someone who's close has been affected. The higher incentive is for those who were already st uh, stricken by a light, a lightning, and they don't want to be st uh, striked again. So if you, for example, had an, an issue of breast cancer and you are recovered and you're back to life, this is where we see uh, more involvement uh, uh, in you know, preventing the next thing, doing more tests, uh, more aware of any glitch in the blood test or any glitch in, the, in any test that they do. Because, you know, we read the blood test and sometimes we are off the chart at some elements and we say, okay, it's not a big deal. But for those who are already affected, they are highly uh, incentivized to check every element. So, for example, we see on our platform higher involvement for patients who, are, who has already experienced cancer in some sort. And they're healthy and they're back to their normal lives, but they're still engaging because everything that goes a little bit wrong with their life or tests uh, they are fully stressed and they check everything. And then, for example, they upload to Dave. Dave, for example, can analyze their medical documents. So you upload to Dave a blood test result. Knowing your history of, let's say, um, uh, pancreatic, uh, sorry, breast cancer, it will say, well, listen, maybe you should pay attention to this because it's it starts to indicate that uh, there is a risk here. Go to see your physician. So for this kind of population, we do see a, a lot of incentive for prevention. Thanks for that, Yurad. Uh, I'm going to start to sort of pull things together and ask each of you as panelists for some final words and, uh, and thoughts and the big priorities. But before I do that, are there any areas that we haven't covered that anybody would like to speak about? Okay. Great. Well, we have covered a lot of ground. Uh, so really, I, I just like your thoughts on the big priorities. And we started off talking about revolutionizing care and research. If there were one or two really big things that could make a profound difference to that, uh, what do you think they are? Big question, I know, but maybe just some final thoughts on that. Uh, if I can start with you, Chaim. Yeah, I think there are several things that are uh, that could really uh, uh, help us make more progress and, and faster. Uh, so I think one is to uh, provide more access to large sets of data, like uh, you know nationwide uh, data lakes, etc., where everything is anonymized and so on. So uh, patient safety and uh, privacy is, is maintained, but to allow the, the industry, the academia, access to all this data of different uh, sources that, that could accelerate um, new developments. Um, the other part 
that I already mentioned is uh, helping with all this workflow and integrations between different systems. I think uh, many hospitals and labs today uh, are, you know, a, a lot behind what you see in, let's say, the high tech or communication industries in, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how the different systems can interact with one another and, and the connectivity. So I think we need to push that forward. And maybe last but not least, I think um, because of all these questions around the uh, regulations and, and reimbursement and so on, I think for any new technology to really uh, get adopted and make a difference, we need, we could really use the help of, of governments, um, like pushing this forward. I know that in, in the UK, for example, there's a lot of, uh, of push from the governments. We have uh, the well, Wales government uh, uh, helping uh, helping also us with a, a nationwide deployment of AI across uh, Wales. We have uh, the NHS with, with uh, very important projects to digitize uh, their, their labs and to bring AI into the labs. Uh, and we're also, as IBEX, we're involved in several of these really exciting projects. So I think overall, uh, Help is needed, but then once that uh, first push is uh, is provided, I think uh, yeah, clinicians see the benefits, and and they're enormous. And this will really, this is already revolutionizing how patients are being uh, diagnosed and treated. Thanks, Chaim. Uh, Irad. Yeah. So. Um, uh... Chaim was spot on about regulations. Uh, the number one killer for many startups and uh, evolution in this industry is, is regulation. And the regulation should, and, and I think it is, but it should be more being addressed and calibrated to the era uh, that we live in, where a AI kicks into almost every aspect of our lives. And yes, there, there are boundaries that need to be made. There are new regulations that need to be written, like the one that is now called the Responsible AI Regulation uh, that, is going to, uh, that is going to, um, you know, put an end to, to, uh, to a big chaos of what is allowed and what is not allowed for LLM and patients to, uh, to do together. So, yeah, regulation is number one, and, and I think more is needed there. Uh, I, I see more and more... Uh, providers and pharma opening up innovation centers because they they acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of thing invented you know outside and they need to bring it in to be you know up to date and to provide cutting edge service to to their audience otherwise they would just lose their audience so uh, i i encourage more and more of those to open up innovation centers to bring in new startups new technology to test it out in a safe environment and uh, we are contributing our part to that by educating and helping them to do this. Um, maybe uh, the other obstacle that I see um, is, you know, investments in this industry. They are huge, but due to the fact that, you know, I was in the IT field, uh, I could develop a, a product and in three months I could put a prototype into a friend's production environment because he was a tech savvy early adopter on a lower grade environment where it doesn't hazard his, his users. But you cannot do this with healthcare. You have to get FDA approvals. You have to get do a lot of uh, testings if you bring a new medical device or, or a new drug. So from the moment you start the journey until the moment you have a paying customer is a long, a long way. But once you get all the burden and you get MSAs with larger companies, then it's much easier to bring in the new te te technologies. So I encourage more investors to go to go into that field uh, to to be able to accelerate it because uh, change is needed and we are all doing our part, but it can be done without investment money. Thank you, Irad. And Alex, you get the last word. <laughs> um, well, I'd, I'd encourage um, innovators and anybody that's developing tools that leverage data um, to to think implementation. So think about how those tools can be implemented in clinical workflow so that our amazing clinicians can really help move the dial from reactive to proactive and preventative care. Um, and for cancer, that means, you know, giving 
fact finding and, 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 and giving vaccines, finding and treating patients as early as possible. So, you know, we not only uh, lengthen lives, but we save lives. Thanks for that, Alex. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of this roundtable discussion. Uh, for all those watching, uh, thank you for doing so. And please share this discussion as widely as you can. It really does deserve to be shared and heard by as many people as possible. Uh, I'd like to thank Alex and Chaim and Irad for joining us and sharing their experience uh, and knowledge. Uh, I hope this discussion has in its own modest way helped just push forward the subject of how we revolutionize uh, care uh, and research for cancer. And I'm sure we'll follow up on some of the themes that have been aired today. So thank you for all those watching. Uh, again, please share this as widely as possible. And thank you to a fabulous panel, Irad, Chaim and Alex. Uh, thank you.